Hi, everybody, and welcome back to Digital Integrated Circuits. I'm Professor Adam Thiemann of the Enix Labs at Bar Ilan University, and today we'll be doing Lecture 8, which is all about SRAM. So, our lecture will include a first look at memory, then we'll go over the 60 SRAM bit cell, the operation of the 60 SRAM bit cell, and then we'll go into stability issues and finally static noise margin calculation. So, let's start with the first look at memory. Well, why memory? What's the motivation? I'll give you a few chip examples to look at this. So going as far back as 2001, if we look at the Intel Pentium M, you can see the 2 megabyte L3 cache. This whole thing was just a bunch of memory. You can see that, um, that memory can really take up 50%, probably much more of the chip, because a lot of these blocks inside have their own internal memories. So memory is huge. It's actually most of the chip area. It uh, is it responsible for most of the power. It's often the performance bottleneck. Memory is a, a huge, huge part of the chip. Going to newer chips, you can take, um, for example, the 10th generation Comet, uh, Comet Lake that came out in 2020. There we already have 20 megabytes of L3 cache versus the 2 megabytes that we add on the Pentium M. So really, extra chip area is used for cramming more and more memory into the chip. The memories here that you can really see are now interleaved in between the, the multi-core chip, but they're also all over the place on such a chip. And just uh, an extreme example that just came out um, last month. Well, you have Cerebrus. They have what they call their wafer scale engine. This is the second version of the wafer scale engine. And yes, this is a fork, and this is a knife, and um, this is the chip. It's actually a whole wafer that they turn into one chip. And basically, the reason for doing this is to get as much memory on chip as possible. And this monster has 16 gigabits of on-chip memory, which is several orders of magnitude more than any other chip that you, you can find, because this is actually many, 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 many chips that are um, somehow interleaved together. When we discuss memory, there's a very well-known hierarchy that if you've done any types of introductions to computing or computer architecture, you should be um, uh, knowledgeable about this part. Um, so here you can see that we have uh, whatever goes up higher is a faster type of a memory, but it also means that it's a more expensive type of a memory. And when we go lower on this pyramid, we get higher capacity, in other words, more bits, but usually that means we lose out in terms of the speed to access each bit. Uh, um, obviously, the, the higher the capacity is because the cost is reduced. So when we start at the top, we have registers, and registers are um, like the CPU registers and flip-flops that are really close and easy to use and so forth. Um, so, so that's usually made with flip-flops or very, very, very fast uh, versions of the SRAM uh, that we're going to be seeing right now. Um, then you go on to the different levels of cache. So you would have like an L1 and an L2 cache, maybe uh, an L3 cache as we saw on the Intel chips uh, before. And these are going to be big, big, big blocks of SRAM. Okay, and they um, hold things close to the uh, to the CPU or to the computing units that can be accessed very quickly. Um, then we need to go off chip, and off chip means we have DRAM. Okay, that's usually our main memory. Those are those DIMMs, those big uh, chips that have eight or sixteen gigabit uh, bytes of memory or so forth. That's going to be in DRAM, but that's already a separate chip. And when we go off the chip, we're limited in the bus width. It takes a long time to access it. The latency is high, etc. Um, plus the, the actual power required for refreshing those DRAMs is pretty high and it makes the, um, the whole system more complex because we need extra chips inside our, pa inside our um, system. Okay. Um, further, if, we, if the DRAM isn't enough, we have to go to secondary storage and there are different types of secondary storage. There are also um, there, this, this whole area of hierarchy is now um, under renovation because we're starting with all kinds of new emerging memories such as RERAM, STTM RAM, and so forth. But in general, we usually have some uh, local hard disks, which uh, um, maybe you would have SSDs nowadays, which are high-speed hard disks. Um, but that's secondary storage, and the access to them takes a lot, lot longer, but we get a, a lot more... Um, uh, bytes for our buck, I guess you could call it there. It's much cheaper. And then you can go to remote, remote secondary storage, which will already be cloud storage, where we have to go through the internet or something like that in order to, uh, to, to, to store our stuff over there. So when we go into the classification of memories, we have these memory arrays. There are different types. In a, in a really wide type of classification, we have over here on the left random access memory, and that's 
basically what we're talking about. There are other types of memories, such as CAMs, and I'm not going to be discussing them here in this uh, in, in this lesson. Um, and serial access memories, which are more like things like shift registers, um, FIFOs, and that type of cues, which will probably also be made out of memories. But in general, what we're, we're discussing now is random access memories, where you can um, go and address any bit or any byte in the memory at any given time. You don't have to access them according to a certain uh, um, a certain uh, order. Okay. Um, inside random access memory, we have what we call ROM or non-volatile memory, which is uh, read-only, which you cannot write over and so forth. And we'll uh, be discussing it a little bit in, uh, in a future lecture. But um, what we're going to be discussing here is more um, read or write of memory, which is also random access memory, RAM, and that's volatile memory. Volatile means that when we turn off the battery of the computer, um, we, lose, uh, we lose the storage that was over there. And specifically, we're going to be talking about static RAM in this lecture, where dynamic RAM is, a, uh, is another type that we're going to be discussing in a future lecture. So we have to classify these things with uh, in several ways the size how many bits bytes or words we have in our memory what the timing parameters of the memory are what the read access time is the write access time is and usually the worst of the two read access and write access is what we would call a cycle time what the functionality of the memory and that's what we discussed here is it a read only memory is it going to be non-volatile so when we um, load up our computer the memory is still going to be there is it going to be a read write memory which is generally a volatile memory which means that we have to replenish it or uh, restore it to uh, when uh, according to you know the, the state of our computer at this moment or is it going to be like a non-volatile read write memory which is kind of a combination I guess of the two such as our flash disk or so forth uh, which will store the data even when we turn off the battery but we are able to overwrite the uh, what is on there Okay, what kind of access pattern? So as we said before, is it going to be a random access where we can go and access any byte or any word at any given time? Or is it going to be some sort of a um, ordered access like a FIFO first in first out queue, a LIFO a last in first out queue, a shift register, a CAM or so forth? Um, and uh, what about the architecture? Um, is it, it going to be single ported so we can only access one read or write? Um, operation during a single cycle or is it going to be multi-ported where we can do more than one read or write operation and how many okay and what is the application of this type of memory is it going to be embedded memory which means it's on chip with the functional units okay which is what we're discussing actually in this lecture or is it going to be an external memory such as a DRAM which is going to be closely um, bonded to the uh, actual uh, chip itself um, so we get rather high uh, access speeds but uh, it's still it, it's, it's more costly and it's farther away than these embedded memories which are in the VL same VLSI process or is it going to be secondary where it's really um, a cable away or maybe even more than that so it's a much farther and slower type of a memory so when we discuss this random access type of a memory, the, the concept is that a memory is just a linear array. Okay, so we have this big, big array of data, um, such as we probably program with C, and each of these arrays is a piece of data. Um, we would call it, I guess, a word or something like that. And um, each of these boxes has a, a bunch of data, but when we need millions and billions of these uh, pieces of data, we're going to have this long and skinny shape. Okay, so let's say we wanted to, to, to make a one megabyte memory, so we have a million uh, uh, bytes. Okay, so usually when we discuss memories, we're discussing in powers of two, um, but we can also uh, kind of use the basically uh, decimal type of uh, um, number that's close to that to make things a bit easier. So when we say one megabyte, it sounds like it's a, 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 you know, a million bytes, but it's actually two to the power of 20 um, bytes or... Uh, or if a word is a, a byte, so that's 2 to the power of 20 words that are each 8 bits wide, okay, because a byte is 8 bits, okay, that means we have a total of 2 to the power of 23 bits. Each of these words is going to be in a separate row. That's really long. If we want a decoder to reduce the number, so let's say instead of uh, trying to send, you know, 2 uh, to the 20 lines across here with each one going to a separate uh, uh, a separate row over here what we would conceptually do is we can reduce that by adding a decoder over here okay so the decoder has would have the uh, you know two to the 20 lines out there but uh, uh, 
but um, we could reduce uh, the number of access pins to 20 address lines in order to get to that. Okay. So if we'd uh, pitch fit the decoder to the word uh, word cells, we'd have uh, word lines with no extra memory access, um, uh, no overhead of area. So that means that each of the gates or the logic that would drive one of these guys would be the same size as the memory cell itself. That's pitch fitting, and we'll see that um, later conceptually how that works. Um, but the output, which we would call the bit lines, we'll see in a minute, would be very long. So let's say that uh, we are reading this out to something over here. We would need to go through all this 2 to the power of 20 cells in order to, we'd have a line that would go between them getting all there. Uh, that would be really, really, really long, and it's a huge decoder. Uh, a decoder of 20 to the, 2 to the power of 20 is just huge, and the delay is extreme. So um, what we get here is that the array's height is about 128,000 times larger than its width. So if you do 2 to the 20 over 2 to the 3, because there are 8 of these bits over here, that's going to be 128,000 times um, higher than it is wide. In other words, this is a very unfeasible type of a structure, and obviously it is not done. So what, what do we do? We want to make things square. Okay, so if we take this conceptually long, long, long array and cut it, fold it somewhere, we can get something that's a lot more square. And then our lines, um, just to access a single bit, will be uh, divided in a, in a very uh, uh, harsh way. Okay, so let's say we take our one megabyte, which we said is 2 to the 23 bits. So let's try to make that square. So we'll take 2 to the 12 of them, make them rows, and 2 to the 11 of them, and make them columns. Okay, so 2 to the 12 is about 4,000. Okay, so we have 4,000 rows, and uh, we need a 12-bit decoder now. Okay, so the decoder over here is going to be 12 bits. Okay, 12, 12 to 2 to the 12 is much smaller than uh, 20 to 2 to the 20. Okay, and that will select a single row over here. Okay, and there's going to be about 2,000 columns, so 2 to the 11 is about 2,000. And that's uh, going to be 256 8-bit words. So if... Um, if this is one word, and this is another word, and this is another word, each of them being 8 bits, there are going to be a total of 256 words that are going to be folded and stored into one, into one row. But we only want to select one of these. We want to be byte addressable, say, and we only want to select one of these bytes, this byte or this byte. And so what we need to do is to um, take the outputs of all of these columns and somehow get only the column we wanted. We only wanted this column, say, which means we need a multiplexer over here. Okay, this here, you can see that a multiplexer, since we often make it, uh, make this multiplexer with a decoder, it can be called a column decoder. So this can be called a row decoder or an X decoder. Uh, and this one can be called a uh, column multiplexer or a Y decoder. Okay. Um, what we're going to do now is, since this actually addresses words, there are going to be many words over here, we would call this a word line. And since these guys are going to be taking the bits out of the words, we're going to call that a bit line. Okay. So let's see some special considerations about this. The core of the memory array is huge. The core is this part, where all the bits are. These are just bits that are stored there. Memory cells um, that are stored there. We will try to make the bit cell, that's the actual circuit that stores one bit of data. We're going to try to make it as small as possible. If we look at a standard flip-flop that we saw in the last lecture that can hold one bit of data, it uses at least 10 transistors per bit. Usually, many more than 20 transistors. That's very, very big, and going and making millions of these on the chip is not going to be very feasible. Okay, so we're going to try to make this bit cell as small as possible, and we're going to see how. And we have to uh, trade off area, which is probably our most, most important consideration here for other circuit properties. We're going to lose out on noise margins, logic swing, speed, and different design rules. And that's going to um, uh, not be our optimal thing. So usually when we made standard cells, we wanted to have as high noise margins as possible, a full rail-to-rail -rail sw swing, real high speed, and meet design rules that will give us high yield. With uh, SRAM, we're going to go and see how we can make the smallest bit cell possible, and maybe it's going to impede these things a little bit, at least to a point where we can still accept it. Okay, um, And to do this, we're also going to need special peripheral circuitry. When we say peripheral circuitry, we're talking about those decoders that we discussed before, different um, bit line conditioning circuits, different timing circuits, and so forth that are going to help us do this. And that we're going to discuss um, throughout this lecture. So just 
going for a last thing about a general memory architecture, and this is also true for DRAM and possibly for uh, different types of uh, non-volatile memory and so forth. So what we're usually going to have is something that looks like this. So we have the core over here, this big block, and then the peripherals, which include a row decoder, um, a column decoder, sense amplifiers, which can be after the decoder or before the decoder, and so forth. We're going to call the um, the horizontal axis a word line. We're going to call the um, vertical axis a bit line. We're going to call the actual cell that stores one bit of data, a storage cell or a bit cell, um, the, the things that... Um, that, that, that realize what if it was a one or a zero inside the cell we're going to call them sense amplifiers and we're to write a one or a zero we're going to use column uh, bit drivers uh, bit line drivers okay so um, let's give some letters here that show what things are now these are not standard letters but they are a bit more um, intuitive for people because I gave the letters that have to do with what they, they deal with. So if we're talking about a memory, how big is a memory? Usually a memory is made out of words. Words can be a byte as we saw in the examples before, or it can be something like 32 bits or 64 bits. Um, those are sizes of words. So usually a memory, uh, you usually um, are dealing with a word. Like for example, integers are usually 32 bits. So one word would be 32 bits. So if we're talking about the memory, we're going to have W words. So W is for words okay and each word is going to be c bits c for columns that's why i called it c okay so each of these words is c bits and that means we're going to have a total memory size of w times c bits we don't usually talk about bits again we usually talk about either bytes or words but it's important for us as circuit designers to understand how many bits there are because our basic um, like atomic structure is the bit or the bit cell okay um, since we have uh, w words Right, we we uh, have an address bus that um, is going to be a log uh, two of that. So um, we have W words again. Each of these guys is going to need a word line. Um, so we need a, a log two of that to to uh, uh, to address it if we have a decoder over here. So um, the size of the decoder is going to be called A and A for address. So two to the power of A is going to be equal to W. So we're going to have a total of A addresses that run across our chip and come in and allow us to address W words. So um, that means that um, we would have again, as we saw before, this linear array with a, a ton, a ton, ton of, uh, 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 of bytes. But what we're going to do is we're going to fold it. How are we going to fold it? We're going to fold it in uh, two, 2 to the power of m, where m is multiplexer. And the multiplexing factor is m. What that means is that we're going to have a multiplexer over here, the column decoder, that's going to get m bits. And the m bits select out of 2 to the m folds over here one, uh, just one. So our uh, multiplexer is going to be um, from 2 to the m to 1. That means we need m bits of the address going into this multiplexer and selecting one word out of 2 to the m words that are folded into each row over here. And that's called our multiplexing factor. So the total number of rows we have is going to be reduced by this factor of m. So we have we don't have a row, uh, 2 to the power of a rows, which we said was going to be a real long thing. We folded it 2 to the power of m times, so we're going to have 2 to the power of a minus m rows. So we have the addresses that are going in here are going to be from a minus 1 until m. That's the bits of the address, the msb bits of the address are going to go into here, and there's a total of, um, uh, of a minus 1 uh, bits over here number of columns so we're going to have again a folding factor we're going to have two to the power of m words in one row okay each of these words it consists of c bits so we're going to have a total of c times two to the power of m columns okay where again that's two to the m words and so again we need a row decoder that takes uh that goes from um from addresses a minus one to m which is a total of a minus one to 2 to the power of a minus, uh, sorry, a minus m to 2 to the power of a minus m. Uh, that's the number of rows we have here. And the column decoder is going to take the bottom m bits, okay? So it's going to take address m minus 1 to 0, and uh, it's going to uh, multiplex 2 to the power of m um, words into 
uh, one word where uh, there's actually C of these columns or the width of the, uh, of the uh, column multiplexer is going to be um, C. So we'll continue now and go into the SRM bit cell and we'll get back to the structure and all those letters which can be confusing in a later lecture.